Welcome back to a professional match of StarCraft 2. Now, what I've got for you today is a best of five series of Protoss versus Terran, where in game number one, we find ourselves on the map a light shade. Now, this series was recommended to me by many of you guys over the last couple of days. I'm excited to figure out what it's all about. So thank you for those of you that reached out and said that this particular PVT is awesome. Now, spawning here in the bottom right hand corner in game number one, playing with the red Protoss pieces and already sending out one of those probes to watch what seems to be the other side of the map. We have none other than Max Pax. His opponent in the opposite corner from France, one of the strongest Terrans in the world. He's playing with the blue SCVs and he goes by the name of Clem. Now, the reason I'm excited to figure out what this particular series is all about is because this is the ESL Open Cup Europe number 54 Grand Finals. I know, it's a bit of a mouthful. But basically what I'm trying to say is that this is one of those weekly tournaments where these two met in the Grand Finals. And I guess it's not too surprising to see Clem there. I mean, Clem, like I said, is genuinely one of the very best StarCraft players in the world. But Maxpex is very much so still up and coming. Now... I went to the Liquipedia page to see the notable signups for this particular uh, ESL Open Cup, and there's like a crazy long list. So I, I, I'm not gonna name everyone, but there's DNS, Goblin, Gong Fu Banda, Mana, Lilbo, Shadone, Skillless, Hero Marine, wins pretty much all of these. Uh, there is Soul, Sort of, Sulir, Vanya, Raynor, Lambo, and Bly. I mean, all of those guys more than capable of winning one of these? Well, some more so than others, I suppose, but the fact that like these two met in the Grand Finals is pretty fantastic. I'm excited to figure out though what ends up going down. Maxpex is very well known for playing some cheeky build orders. As a matter of fact, the proxy gateway in the earlier game is actually known as the Maxpex. I think it was Beastie Cutie that popularized this uh, a little while ago, about a year or so ago. And one thing that I really actually also think is worth mentioning about Maxpex is that Maxpex is very much so in the shoes of Clem where he was at like two years ago. So, Clem, I mean, he's like 18 years old right now, okay? He's basically a boomer when it comes to StarCraft terms, okay? But I said like three years ago that this guy was one of the people to watch out for because he, he showcased some really good control. And it feels like Maxpex, being 16 years old right now, is in a very similar spot. Maybe not quite as highly ranked yet. I mean, definitely not quite <laughs> as highly ranked yet. But, I mean, he can get there, right? So, I'm excited to see where this particular series goes. Because, uh, I mean, I've hyped up Clem for uh, a very long time, and he got there eventually, right? I'm excited to see if maybe I can do the same thing for Maxpex. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. Not that my cheering has anything to do for it or with it, but at the very least, uh, put him on your radar, I suppose. Remember the name. He also plays some fun StarCraft. I know a lot of you are very fond of watching this man cheese. Anyways, so, this is the annoying part about putting that, uh, that gateway on the other side of the map. Command center will be cancelled just so that Clem can restart it again instead of the main base. But this already creates an advantage right now for the Protoss player. He's going to be forced to obviously rebuild that gateway at home. So that's going to cost him a, a 150 minerals extra. And obviously there's the cost of the pylon on the other side of the map as well that will likely get picked off here eventually. But this is uh, a situation. My god, the micro here between these two already. I love it. This is a situation where it becomes uncomfortable. I don't think Clem is going to be too bothered by that, but many a ladder hero are not going to feel that confident after they get thrown off of their standard build order. So we'll see where this is going to go. Maxpex definitely very experienced playing this kind of thing, so he's going to follow this up right now with a robotics facility at home. Another gateway will be coming up as well. As long as he keeps up the pressure here, I mean, this is some good pressure. Yeah, he can actually continue uh, hanging out here for a little while longer. There's a, uh, a Banshee right now that's being produced. Clem is probably planning on sending that one straight across the map. Don't think you want to be fighting Stalkers with it, but obviously if the Stalkers are here, they're not at home. So maybe he can get some work done. But already, this is an awful lot of damage right now that's being done by the Danish Protoss player. Even though it's a proxy gateway, it's kind of like a 12 pool right now in Zerg versus Protoss, you know? 12 pool is actually like a pretty good macro build. This also feels like a macro build where you just, you know, try to keep your opponent in an uncomfortable position where you might just be able to accidentally win the game early on. So nice scouting over here as well with that adapt. He now knows exactly what it is that he's likely going to be going up against. There's an observer coming up, so is at the very least will, uh, he will be capable of countering uh, the cloaked benches here. At this point though, there will probably be enough marines to start uh, pushing. At the very least, to try and expand towards the low ground. Cyclone joins in right now, too. 
That being said, there's really not that much available here for the Protoss player at home. So let's see how much damage that Benshi can deal here in just a bit. Cyclone gets picked off relatively easily, though. A little bit of sloppy control right there by the French Terran. Command Center will once again be forced. Here's a, uh, a shield battery inside of the mineral line. Warpin will continue here. There's already one of those observers chasing down the Benshi. And you know what? Max Pax is heavily outplaying Clem so far in this particular game. That's pretty insane. <laughs> I'll have a look actually in a little bit where these two are ranked right now. Uh, after this game on Aligalek. Oh my god. Is he got... Oh, he even gets the Siege Tank. Wow. So there's no Stimpak or anything just yet, right? Nah, I can't afford that. Additional Stalkers get warped in. I think that might just be a little bit too much. There's an Observer right now over here too. There we go. My god, that's a lot of damage that's being done right here by Max Pax. And, well, the single G is cold. Nicely done right there. All right, so I had a quick look. As of me making this video, Mr. Clem is considered to be on Aligalek. For those of you wondering, that's a statistics website for, uh, for StockCraft 2. It basically keeps track of all of the online and offline tournaments that are being played. And then it ranks the different pro gamers, depending on how well they've done recently as well as historically. But anyways, long story short, Clem, as of me making this video, is considered to be the highest ranked Terran player on the planet. Isn't that insane? I didn't realize it was quite that extreme. Now, obviously, it's always a little difficult to say what actually is going on. I mean, there's Maru, there's TY. There's a whole bunch of very good Terran players out there, but Clem certainly is amongst the very best. And likewise, actually, I didn't realize it was this extreme yet for Max Pax either. As of me making this video, he's considered to be the rank 7 outside of South Korea and the rank 20 in the world overall. Now, once again, this man is just 16 years old. Pretty, pretty insane. Anyways, double gases right here pretty quickly from Max Pax. We'll see what he decides to do. Because I've got a feeling there, uh, there might be some more cheese on the menu, dude. There's a lot of cheese that these guys are capable of. I mean, Clem very well known. That, that's, I guess, the only caveat with some of Max Pax's games. Clem is very well known for just playing that stock standard Terran style, right? And that's usually what carries you to very highly ranked or, or very high ranks if you do it really, really well. I feel like the limit for cheese is not quite as high. Oh, is Max Pax gonna go for that? Could this be Proxy Stargate? You know, like that Proxy Stargate stuff that I've been playing a little bit myself as well? I carried that to Master 1 and I was quite proud of me, but I... <laughs> I don't know exactly how well that's gonna go against someone of the caliber of Clem, though. So there's a Zealot coming out right now. Cybercore will finish. He does have 150 gas. He goes for an Adept too. I guess that Adept is mostly just to, uh... There it is. Oh my god. Uh, I think that Adept is mostly just here to, uh... To shoo away any, any Reapers and to start putting on a little bit of pressure, so... Well, there's actually no Reaper in this particular game, but... Uh, to put on a little bit of pressure so the Stargate can at the very least finish up some of the structures. Or some of the units, right? So... This has to be Void Ray shenanigans. He could go for an additional pylon, yeah, and then start putting shield batteries over here. Now, this is a pretty macro-focused one. So, with the version of this build that I was playing, I was cutting probes left, right, and center, and it created a complete all-in. I don't know how well this is gonna go against someone like freaking Clem, though. Clem is fantastic. I mean, he doesn't know at this point what's going on. I would have loved to see, you know, him check right there with the SCV, the scouting SCV that went to the other side of the map before this Adept comes in, because right now it's gonna be very difficult to get that scouting intel. The Zealot will definitely fall. There's the Void Ray coming up, and there's the two shield batteries. Clem is already making a bunker, and he sees actually... Oh, what? Oh, okay, he gives up on it. Wait, what? No, he doesn't. That's... Okay. I think he probably didn't intend on losing the Zealot there and the Adept so easily. Probably a little bit of miscontrol. The problem is that this bunker is in range of those shield batteries, so Max Pax canceled them prematurely, knowing that they would be in range. But there comes the Void Ray. What's Clem gonna do next? He could definitely go for an NG Bay here in a little bit as well and start producing some of those missile turrets to zone away these Void Rays. He's already gonna queue up, though, the very first Cyclone right now as well as the Lock-On Upgrade. So the Lock-On ability makes defending this kind of shenanigans much, much easier. The problem is that Void Rays, usually you make only a couple of them, so you produce a few of them, and then you transition... Well, not a couple. You probably only make, like... Well, this is not bad. <laughs> you uh, you make a, a bunch of them and then you transition a little bit later on if you want to towards Tempest as well. And Tempest are really scary. 
Oh my god, he gets a free cyclone. Um... Guys? If he can... Oh my god, yeah, if he can snipe that, that tech lip, it's game over. <laughs> Fine Danish cheeses. Let's see. Danish cheeses deliciously decadent. What are names for Danish cheeses? Esrom, a semi-soft washed rind cheese made from pasteurized cow's milk. Dana Bleu, Blue Castello. I mean, I don't know actually if these are... Are these really from Denmark? I'm not sure, dude, but I, I, I will let you know that Max has uh, a very refined palate. <laughs> <laughs> My god, all right. So, it's a best of five series, right? That means that the first player to win three maps is the one that will eventually become uh, the victor. That means that Clem, if he wants to win this series right now, cannot afford dropping a single map. And you know what? In the previous game, he played pretty safely, right? He just ended up losing the one Cyclone. And then, you know, if you, if you lose the tech lab, right, on the factory, not only can you no longer produce Cyclones, you also lose that upgrade that he was researching there for like the better part of a minute already. Um, it becomes an absolute disaster. So, a little bit of sloppy control so far in this series here for Clem, and you can see that Max Pack strikes right away. I think in theory, on paper... Oh my god, really? I think he's gonna do... Uh, I think he's gonna do the exact same thing again. Um, in theory, on paper, the player that plays defensively should always have an advantage. The problem is that defending strategies is usually much harder than attacking, right? And being the aggressor. So... Hmm... If Clem can play this perfectly, I think he should be able to defend these kind of cheeses relatively easily. Well, perfectly and relatively easily probably don't go that well together. But if he is, like, on point, right? He should be able to <laughs> defend this kind of Stargate shenanigans without too much trouble. Now, every pro gamer can have an off day, right? Even pro gamers are human, believe it or not. I've been telling you guys this for a little while, but for some reason this, this is not generally accepted. <laughs> Alright, so the probe gets spotted. I actually like the fact that the Stargate is over there, just because this makes it hard for Clem to find. I think the shield batteries are supposed to go up though, but actually sniping that uh, that one probe is actually huge, right? That's very, very helpful. Zealot will come across right now. Like, the problem is Clem can't really fight this, this pylon. The Reaper is very slow to actually kill that. So the Stargate is gonna start producing units whether he likes it or not. Zealot just marches straight into the main base. One big advantage this time around for Clem, actually, I didn't quite point that out yet, is the fact that he didn't actually... I don't think he, he did, right? No, he didn't actually start up a command center at all, so he went straight into a 1-1-1. This is much safer to play, because now he's already starting up a Cyclone very early on. Obviously, this also makes it a single base opener, right? So he only has one base, meaning that if Max just expands behind this, he's probably going to be fine. It's not too uncommon to see a bunch of Stargate units in the earlier stages of the game. Now, he is still going to commit to this. I don't know if that's the best choice, to be honest. I guess the problem is right now for the Protoss is that you don't know if there's like a command center already. He did see the timing, I guess, of that starport, so you should know that... Yeah, this is not likely going to be an expo here from the from the Terran player, but I'm, I'm having question marks so far here by this approach. Oh, nice control this time around there on that Cyclone. Does take a bunch of base damage, but... Since this gets pushed back right now, I don't really see this really doing too much, right? I mean, maybe. Good lock on once again. Really good control. Oh my god, Clem, that was beautiful. He wants to uh, keep that little line, obviously, in range there of the, the Void Ray, but he doesn't want to lose the Cyclone in the process. And despite the fact that this is a pretty safe position there for the Stargate, it is actually attackable there over the, the Mineral Patches. All right. Maybe putting the Stargate over there would be a bit of a better spot. I think that this is mostly defended. Now, I love this as well, actually. Clem now starts up an engineering bay in his opponent's natural. So he's already thinking ahead, right? He's like, okay, what can my opponent do after this? One of the Void Rays sadly there gets sniped. Ooh, well, Cyclones are going down as well, but that's two Void Rays down the drain. And you know what? The Viking, yeah, is going to continue chasing this for a little while longer. This time around, I think that Clem has got this one in the bag. Since there's no expo here for uh, for the Protoss, and he's not going to be able to start up an expo here anytime soon either, this becomes a bit of a problem. He's adding on additional gateways. So he's transitioning to watch a 4-gate? I actually like it. 
You know, this is him putting all of his eggs in one basket, but maybe Clem decides to get a little bit greedy, right? He expends a little bit too uh, too early or, or something along those lines, and he's not really defending hard enough. Um, this, yeah, this is still something that can potentially work out. He's going for the Twilight Council, but there's still no expo, right? And this SUV over here has been scouting around as well. It sees a bunch of stalkers right now marching down the ramp. I think he's just planning on killing the NG Bay just to make his opponent think that there might be potentially an expansion here coming up for the Protoss. But judging by the fact right now that we're up to five gateways, and I mean the fact that he will probably go blink or something along those lines here in a little bit, um, yeah, there's there's definitely not going to be an expo here for the Protoss. I guess, though, if you're Clem right now, right, and you look at this and you're like, okay, that thing got killed, I saw three stalkers, I've cleaned up the cheese, I can start up a third command center. If that's what Clem does... This could be game over. Siege tank comes up right now. Raven comes up as well. Love it. There's a bunker here for safety too. I mean, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. Clem is very far ahead. I'm just pointing out that there is a chance that this is still something that the uh, the Danish Protoss can come back from. He only shows three stalkers right now once again, which I really like. This makes uh, Clem think that these are the same stalkers that he saw earlier. So maybe he will become a little bit more brave out onto the map. Now this Reaper Scout over here is brilliant. Really nicely done. And this is going to give Clem all of the intel that he needs. Look at that. He sees the lack of comments, or, well, not comments, center, expansion there on the low ground. He's going to scout around the main base right now, too. I mean, he can do a little bit of harassment here, too. That's not really that important. But seeing the Twilight Council over here, I mean, that should be all he really needs to know, right? Maybe a, uh, yeah, the Raven obviously is here as the detector, right? So you never really know if it's going to be DTs as a follow-up. Vikings pretending to be Cyclones. Blink is not quite done yet. There's an auto turret coming up, I mean. Yeah, GG gets cold. I was going to say, like, this is, I think, just a, a numbers game. So, if this is the way that Clem wants to play it right now, right? I think if you're Max Packs over here, you try to play a macro game. Because if you're forcing Terrans to be to, to be that defensive, right? To go for the 111 before the command center, it means that they are really like they're really looking not to die in the early game to stupid stuff, right? The problem is if you play very, very safe and you cut absolutely no corners, you will probably fall pretty heavily behind against someone who's playing standard macro. I don't know though, that doesn't really seem to be Max Vex's style, but I, I've seen him do a bit in the past and uh, he's definitely capable of playing it. It's just that it must be very scary to play straight up macro against someone like Clem. Why is it though that all the guys that are very good at cheesing, right? The ones that love to play very aggressively and very micro focused in the early game. Why do they all play Protoss? <laughs> like, I guess there's Bly for Zerk. Like, Bly plays pretty cheesily, but I mean... Only, only every once in a while, like maybe a couple times. Uh, like in a best of five series, Bly will probably cheese two to three times, right? But not every single game. <laughs> I'm a fan, don't get me wrong, but it is kind of ironic. Protoss has a lot of different flavors of cheese in the early game. They have the Brie, the Camembert, the Gorgonzola, uh, the, the Mozzarella, the Cheddar, the Feta, the Ricotta, uh... Parmesan. <laughs> they have a they have a lot of different flavors of cheese, I guess. That's the big strength. Anyways, Prop was once again snuck out. Are you really gonna do the same build three times in a row? I I don't really agree. That being said though, you can see Clem is playing super safe. He's building an NG bay in his opponent's natural, right? Just to prevent the expo from coming up at the preferred timing. He's going for the 111 before a command center, it seems like. So, just a single command center right now, but he's not building an additional one. And he's really just making sure that he's covering all of his bases. So, the reactor there on the high ground also... Uh, or, sorry, the probe right there on the uh, on the high ground also confirms what kind of build it is that he's going up against. I mean, he hasn't seen the command center, but usually if it would be an in-main command center, uh, it will be planted down over here. So, Maxpex would have seen that. Once more, though, it's going to be a, uh, a Stargate, but this time around, not on the other side of the map. Are we just going to see an Expo? Oh my god, are both players going to make expansions? Uh, uh, expan- Expansion- Exp- Expan- No. There's a Phoenix. Expansions! Oracle, never mind. Alright. 
That was uh, that one was in the air for a while. Clem also, look at this, building a command center. Oh my god, can you believe it? I didn't think it could happen. This is where the game becomes really fun though. I've always said for like the last decade or so that the scariest players that cheese are the ones that can play macro. Like for example, I think the best examples of this recently are probably Serral cheesing. Like Serral has been cheesing quite a bit, right? And then every once in a while you see players defending the cheese. And I know from being a ladder hero that whenever I play against someone who's cheesing, right? And I realize, okay, you know what? I've defended it. I feel pretty good. The problem is, if you, you know, defend against several cheesing, you're still playing against several, right? <laughs> like, you're still... I think it could have gotten a couple more, to be honest. Anyways, you're still playing against uh, people that can ma play macro. And it's, it's very scary if you're not uh, already in a... Uh, yeah, in an advantage. Oftentimes, we have seen this many times in the past. Uh, there were players like, for example, Haas, who were very successful for a little while until their build orders got nerfed or until their cheese just simply didn't work anymore. Haas is still considered to be very good, but he's definitely not at the, you know, the tippity top of the uh, the pro level. Like, I, I remember Haas playing a Grand Finals, actually. I think this was a DreamHack event or a WCS. I don't really remember specifically, but he made it to the Grand Finals, where he met Serral. Now, Serral shut him down pretty handily. Um, but, you know, like, if you're just cheesing every single game, at some point, people will just, you know, play the player, right? If you know that you're going up against someone who's cheesing every single game, uh, just uh, stop playing the matchup and start playing the player instead. So I would love to see Max Pax incorporating this kind of stuff a little bit more regularly. We'll see how good he is at it. Must be scary, though, playing a macro game when that's not really your preferred playstyle against someone <laughs> like freaking Clem. Clem is reminding me a lot of, like, a, a mix between Bion and Maru. Ridiculously good micro, but also super strong defensive stuff. Although, actually, his micro hasn't looked as strong, actually, in this particular series. Anyhow. Let's see where this is gonna go. We see a, uh, a hit squad right now of a bunch of marines and also three cyclones roaming the minimap. There's already a third command or a third nexus rather coming up here for the uh, the Protoss player. Ooh, this is what I mean, dude. This is not acceptable. Completely caught off guard right here by a, uh, a relatively weird timing, to be honest. Like this is not quite your normal follow up here for Terran. Love the fact that the Viking once again joins in on the ground as well. There's already a third command center being built here by Clem. So forcing the council here on the third nexus should be very reasonable. Although I think, yeah, Clem has bigger plans. You know what? This is like a weird counter cheese over here. There's a couple of phoenixes up in the air, but losing that void ray was super painful. Now with like, yeah, what are you going to do? This is just game over right now. Oh my god. There's no way you can defend this. Clem actually, like, he wasn't planning on winning with this. But now there's a single G over there too. Now he, uh... Yeah, he just grabs the Void Grey, grabs a couple of units, and that's insta-game over. Alright, so, here we go. Game number five, we find ourselves on the map Pillars of Gold. We've had a couple of cheeky games here from Maxpex. Game number one, two, and three, he decided to cheese his opponent. Game number one and two, it worked out. Game number three, Clem played much safer and therefore ended up winning quite handily. Game number four, Maxpex tried to play a... Uh, a macro-ish based build, but he got absolutely shut down there. So let's see what ends up going down right now here on Pillars of Gold. You know what? I would love to see Clem cheese right now. <laughs> Imagine Clem showing his opponent how it's supposed to be done. Let me build a couple barracks on your side of the map. A little bit of Marauder shenanigans or something along those lines. I don't care, man. Get creative. No, that's not really his thing. He doesn't really do that. Yeah, so I, I think Max Pax has a lot of potential to become one of the, you know, one of the greats. It's just a bit of a... It's just a little bit dicey, I guess, when you're really super reliant on balance patches, right? Like, for example, if they decide to nerf... I don't know, this wouldn't be unheard of, right? If they decide to nerf... I think I think they'll probably do a balance patch after IEM Katowice, which is next month. If they decide to nerf either the Void Ray or the Shield Battery, which I don't think is unheard of, I think that would be, yeah, pretty reasonable. A lot of these builds will plummet very quickly, right? Now, Max Pax obviously can certainly practice his macro game as well, and I mean, he's, uh, he's already a very formidable macro player, but you do need to have more longevity, I guess, if you want to become one of the greats, and he, uh, 
Well, he seems to be working on it, but we'll see. Anyhow, can't predict the future. But we'll see where this is going to go. Anyhow. This time around, once again, normal opener here from the, uh, the Protals. No attempted shenanigans here either. We'll see. Yeah, I, I guess it's just a theme. What I'm trying to get at, like, it's definitely possible to win tournaments by cheesing almost every single game. But the fact of the matter is that all of the most successful players that we have always had in StarCraft 1 and in StarCraft 2, they're all macro-focused players, right? So most of them will cheese, but only, say, once or twice in a best-of-five series. So maybe someone can change that at some point, but so far, I've yet to see it. Ooh. <laughs> Ambitious move right there by Max Pax. He thought he was playing Warcraft 3 there for a second. Tried to get a full wrap around there on that, uh, on that one uh, Reaper. The first Adept actually went across the map. Normally that one is tasked with defending. So upon not seeing the, uh, the Adept at the Terran's base, yeah, he knows Max Pax that is, or, or Clem that is rather, that Max Pax decided to send that... Uh, that adapt towards the other side. This should be defendable quite uh, quite handily, though. Yeah, good control right here by Clem. Has a couple of uh, red hit point units. The second adapt joins in right now too, though, and this is where the game becomes a little bit harder, actually. I'm a big fan of these micro wars, actually. This does actually remind me a lot of, of Warcraft 3, right? In Warcraft 3, you can start attacking right away. You send out a Death Knight, you get one of those rods of necromancy, and you just, uh, ooh, well. You just start out microing your opponent right away. There's no hero units in StarCraft 2, but this is about as close as we can go. Now, a little bit of indecisiveness over there by Max Pax. There's a third adept now joining the fray as well. A little bit awkward, a little bit uncommon. Yeah, there's not enough HP on any of these units, though. There's not. That... The mule really has to go back to, to mining. Nice control. Nice control. Okay. So, big picture. We uh, see three adapts going down at the cost of a couple of SCVs, two Marines, and a Reaper. I don't think... Actually, there's a couple probes that got picked off as well. I don't think that's necessarily bad here for Max Pax. He's already following this up right now, actually, with a Glaives upgrade. Okay. I expected that would be a Blink follow-up upon seeing the Twilight Council on the production tab, but... All right. So Glaives, I mean, it basically makes the uh, the Adept's attack significantly faster. It's an attack speed improvement for the Adept's. Not as common right now as the as the Blink opener. So, yeah, we'll see how this ends up uh, how this ends up going. I love this as well. Max Pack pretending like he's playing against Zerk or something creates a a semi wall. Hellion over here is trying to scout out what in the world's happening. Probe over here moves out as well. Okay, is this a fake probe? I'm not entirely sure. There's a Robo coming up right now. No, I don't think he actually wants to expend. I thought maybe he's selling a story here to his opponent. He could go additional gateways right now, since his opponent isn't going to scout this. Here we go, though. Glyphs is done. Resonating Glyphs, that is. That's going to kill the Cyclone pretty handily. Shades is very powerful. Ooh, well, you know what? He shaded right on top of a couple of Marines as well, and that's not quite what you want. Okay. Um... Ambitious move right there by Max Pax. He thought he could probably just grab the Cyclone and then run away, but the Liberator joins in too. And Liberators are very, very scary units. One of the problems, right, if you open up uh, Glaives over, for example, Blink, is that you're not going to have a whole lot of anti-air. So this Liberator can really go to town relatively easily. Third Nexus was delayed here as well in favor of additional Warpins. Dark Shrine right now is a follow-up here from Max Pax. He also started producing... A couple of those immortals. I love the liberators, actually. Yeah, there's no, uh, there's no anti-air at all. So let's see, what are we gonna do? Tickle them to death with sentries? <sighs> yeah. Um. A couple of stalkers were warped in during all of this. But this is a, uh, a very nice situation right now, once again, for Clem to be in. 
He started up the third CC a little while ago, so he's going to be able to now transition towards that three base economy. And with that additional, you can see it right there, uh, barracks to uh, produce out of as well. You can even add on a couple more here very shortly too, to really start pumping out that Marine Marauder production. And Marine Marauder is, is scary, right? It's not really a unit composition uh, that Protoss players can easily counter. I mean, there's not like one unit that's going to do well against that, uh, assuming your opponent is half decent at playing it. So there are a couple of DTs. These will need to get some real work in. This shouldn't work. That being said, I mean, once again, Liberator inside of the main base getting some work done. Um, that being said, I mean, there are no... Oh my god, the missile turrets are not done yet. Does he have detection energy? He does have a scan available. Already though, ooh, that siege tank actually kills a bunch of his own dudes. Missile turret is going to finish up in the main base. And even though quite a few uh, SCVs there were killed, we see the same thing happening right now on the other side of the map with the probes. Ten probes end up going down here to just one Liberator. And keep in mind, right, like... Trading workers, when you're already behind, is not really what you want to be doing. Oh, gets them both. Nice moves right there by Clem. Very, very nice. This is the hardest type of game to play. If you're Clem, that is. It's very difficult to not accidentally die to stupid stuff. <laughs> I feel like that's been a theme in my casts over the last couple of weeks, but... Anyhow. Here's the third uh, Nexus now being acquired. But these yellow mining machines are really going to be the bane of uh, Max's existence over here. What exactly do you do? There's a couple of siege tanks available. Once again, he, he loves being in his opponent's face. I'm a fan of it. I like it, but... It's a bit of a risky move, right? Actually, the Dark Templar over there got some damage in. Alright. That kills six workers. Not bad at all. Once again, Adepts are shading forward. This is, I think, the comeback mechanic that Max is looking for at this point. Just try and shade in, get some work done. This army is not really meant to be fighting. He's just trying to create space, I suppose, to uh, get into his opponent's bases. Grab a couple of worker kills here and there. You know what? This is starting to add up right now. That is uh, a lot of workers going down in this short game so far. And on the back of this, yeah, Scan right now confirms it for Clem as well. The third Nexus has been acquired. You know what? 57 workers here for Protoss versus 50 of the Terran. Mules close that distance quite nicely, but this is now a very playable game once again. I love the threatening there, actually, of bringing the freaking Archon and the Stalkers across the map. These units could definitely not fight this, right? There was no way that those units were going to push into a bunch of siege tanks, and I think there was a Liberator in the air, too. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't have that potential. But I love the fact that he brought them just to look extra threatening, right? He brought his buddies along, just so the DTs could get in, or the one DT actually, and then also as a follow-up, uh, the uh, the triplets of the Adepts. Not bad. Now, as a follow-up, we have the Robotics Bay researching the Extended Thermal Lens, which is awesome. It's gonna give those Colossi a bunch more range. There's already a Disruptor coming up as well, which is also kind of cool. So did Clem see the research there? No, he didn't. Um, I was gonna say, like, why is he already going disruptors? I guess he's just uh, concerned about his opponent's anti-air. Since Clem already has, you know, a pretty good amount of air units at this point, he can easily pump out a couple of Vikings, and that's gonna create a problem for those Colossi if you make too many of them. But he's gonna be able to produce two sources of splash right now, which is neat. In the meantime, though, on the side of the Terran player, there's really nothing out of the ordinary. Been talking a lot about Protoss so far in this series, but I guess it's because he's playing. You know, he's playing something fresh, something that we normally don't really see. Whereas, you know, if you've been watching any StarCraft, you probably know that Terrans like to make Marines, Marauders, Medivacs, Siege Tanks, uh, upgrades, d d those sorts of things. He's actually very active with those DTs. I love it. So he's got uh, the Blink upgrade done right now. Oh, actually, not done yet. But the Blink upgrade is going to finish here very shortly. Another Liberator over here. Actually, I think that's the same one. Yeah, that's, dude, that Liberator is worth its weight in gold. Look at that. I think that was 16 kills or so on that bad boy in total. There's a bunch of Dark Templars somewhere out on the map. Okay. They're joining together right now. So Shadow Stride is the Dark Templar blink ability. That one's going to finish up here in a few seconds. If Terran decides to move out, even when you have detection and reinforcements, these six Dark Templar will blink in and they will kill a lot of units very quickly. Like, they don't mess around. Now, these are not cheap units. 
But the thing is, these Disruptors and these Colossi can keep that Terran army at bay for quite a while. So these, I think, are going to be the stars of the show here, what Maxpex is looking to, uh, yeah, to engage with. They'll probably engage separately from the main army. The Supply Count, though. Like, you can see Clem playing an awfully cautious game right now, right? Like, he has been... <laughs> ever after those first two matches, the first two maps, that is, is he gonna take the bait? No, I don't think you wanna do it. You wanna go in for the surprise, yeah. Skip the Cyclone. Uh, even after, or ever after those first two games, he has been playing super safely. Alright, so here we go. Dark Templars blink forward. They're gonna be able to kill everything that's defending that third base. At the same time, though, uh, those Disruptors are far too far forward. So, oh, I would have loved that move if he didn't just lose, like, half of his big tech units. Ah, that's actually really unfortunate there. Okay. Yeah. There's a planetary finish right now, too. That's not gonna... Well, you know what? Thought it wasn't gonna complete, but it did. I mean, that was still a valuable trade. Don't get me wrong, but... Ah, how many disruptors did he lose there? Four disruptors in total. Ugh. Yeah, I don't like that. I think if we would have kept all of those alive, uh, or maybe lost only like one or two, it, it would have been much easier. I mean, I'm just staring at the supply counts right now, right? And I'm looking at the upgrades here as well. This is a Terran army that's... It's not messing around. <laughs> this Terran army is getting more and more sophisticated. There's a fifth Nexus now being acquired as well, though, by the Protals. Or fourth Nexus, rather, sorry. It's already done, as a matter of fact. It's just that this Terran army, it's pecking a punch. It's not an army that messes around. Okay, he does catch some of it unseized and in a very awkward position where the Terran units are funneling past the tanks, but... Even, like, half this army is gonna be powerful enough, it seems, to, uh, to deal with that of the Protals. At the same time... Ooh, you know what? The Dark Templar have joined up with their buddies, the Zealots, to try and go after the Planetary, and the Planetary actually will go down. But once more, I mean, this is a theme that we saw earlier as well, right, in the Planetary. Now it's costing the rest of the big Protoss units. I guess against someone slightly weaker than Clem. This would have worked really nicely. But the reason why it's not working so well, I don't think, is mostly because of miscontrol by Max's end, right? Like, if he wouldn't have given away all those units, this would have been a very playable uh, spot for him. I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that... I would say, like... Pretty much all of those Disruptors and then the one Colossus, those were all preventable losses. Imagine if there were like a bunch of... Yeah, that would have been very playable. I think I think actually this would have been very playable. Now once again, the DTs, they decide to blink on top of all of this army. And you know what? Maxpex picks up a once again. A good fight. He's picking really good fights. Oh, oh, oh. Nice pickup. Very nice pickup there by Clem. The problem is that that was only half of Clem's force. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was looking at the supply count there. I was wondering, wait a second, how did that just happen? But it's because Clem had uh, a very large amount of units sitting on the other side as well. At this point, the strategy for Maxpex is to cross his fingers Ooh! and hope for the biggest disruptor hit of his life. Maybe not the most reliable strategy, but certainly something that can work out. You know what? There's a lot of potential here. Like, even even if Clem ends up winning this game... Which it is starting to look at. I mean, it's, it's starting to look like that, Rodder. I mean, there's too much. Here come the DTs once again. Picks up every single time. <laughs> you can see that Maxpex has a ton of potential. Not just cheesing, but also playing the macro game. Yeah, there it is. Nicely done right there. Well played, series. Clem ends up winning it 3-2-2 after being 2-0 behind earlier. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, please take one second to hit that like button down below. That way this YouTube might get picked up a bit better by the YouTube algorithm, which would be awesome. That way we can try and continue growing StarCraft 2 going forward as well. If you really enjoyed it, I mean, this is completely optional, but if you really enjoyed it, consider hitting that subscribe button so you get notified as soon as future videos go live. Thank you very much to the Patreon supporters for directly supporting this channel. I appreciate you. If you also want to have a look at all of the different perks that I have available, you can head on over to patreon.com slash locotv. There's also a link down below in the description. But for now, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day. Don't forget to smile. And I'll see you once again in the next one.